let you know that I'm a wreck right now. Um, Pastor Fred and I work really hard to pick out the worship music and have it match the sermon and the theme. And this week, the songs that we did, this is my testimony and my, um, our, my God, this is what he does, kept coming back and they're like, but they don't quite match. They don't quite match, but they kept coming back and I kept looking for more music and looking for more music. And it's like, nope, that's the opening set. And that's Angela's story. And it just, I was crying through the entire worship set because God chose that music um, just to reflect what Don said and to reflect Angela's story. So Angela, when you watch this this afternoon, you've got to listen to those songs because she will watch it this afternoon. So, okay. Whew. All right. I am back. <laughs> um, so our study with uh, First Timothy, it comes to an end today. And I don't know about you, but I hope that it's made an impact. I hope that you discovered a few things through this series. I hope that you learned a little bit about the church, the structure of the church, even perhaps discovered a few things about yourself and your journey as a Christ follower. You know, and maybe... All you discovered was that that great big book that sits on your shelf and collects dust isn't so scary after all, that you actually can pick it up and begin to read it and begin to explore what Christ is saying to you in that. If you missed any of the series, I really recommend that you go back. Just kind of watch it. We have a YouTube channel. You can go back and watch it. You can fast forward. My favorite thing to do is to freeze frame in these silly spots. Pastor Fred looks so funny when I freeze frame him, you know. Go back, watch the sermon. Just pick up some things about you, about the church. Give you a better understanding of the Christian life. And that's what First Timothy was meant to do. First Timothy was a letter written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy, a young leader, and giving him great advice as he's working with a congregation, an established congregation, which can be tough on any young leader. And it brought us on this journey of how to live the Christian life and how we navigate the church today and the world in which we live in today. And we're going to have a little fun today, as you can probably tell from what's sitting in front of me, as we dig into a couple of topics that are like your least favorite topics to talk about in church. One of them is work and your job. And the other one is money and perhaps our value of money. So through the first five chapters, uh, Paul has given Timothy this, this great advice, right? And about false teaching, about the structure of the church and his role as their leader and our role as Christ followers. And now, Paul, he's coming to the end of the letter, and I can just picture Paul. It's like going through, okay, I covered this, I covered this, I covered this. What haven't I covered yet? Let me sit down, figure this out. You know, he, he's he got a scribe who probably writes it down for him. He's like, okay, read that back to me. What didn't I cover yet? Oh, yeah. Slaves. I haven't covered slaves yet. And we're like, okay, he's getting to slaves. I can just check out because I'm not a slave. I'm not a slave owner. I don't have anything to do with this, so I just don't need to read that. But I don't want you to check out quite yet because as I read this passage, I want you to consider your role in the workforce. Are you an employee? Do you devote some of your time, some of your life to an employer? Did you sell your soul to the company store? Or are you an employer or have you been an employer who pays people for their time? If you're retired, were you ever an employee? Were you ever an employer? Are you an example to the current generation? that's just coming into this workforce? These words 
this this standard that Paul has set, it just might apply to you. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting with verse 1, all slaves should show full respect for their masters, so they will not bring shame to the name of God and his teaching. If the masters are believers, that is no excuse for being disrespectful. Those slaves should work all the harder because their efforts are helping other believers who are well loved. So now let me read this to you again. And just for your sake, not that it's in the Bible, I'm going to substitute the words slaves and master for employee, employer. So now you can hear yourself in this, okay? All employees should show full respect for their employers so they will not bring shame to the name of God in his teachings. Do I need to repeat that one? All employees should show full respect to their employers so they will not bring shame to the name of God in his teachings. If the employers are believers, that is no excuse for being disrespectful. Those employees should work all the harder because their efforts are helping other believers who are well loved. Ow, right? Did that hit a little bit harder than the slave interpretation? See, some of us, we love our jobs and there were like, yeah, right. That's, that's perfect. I love my job. I love who I work with. I love who I work for. This is easy peasy. I don't spend a day working because I love my job. And for some of us, not me, not so much. Some dread Monday morning. I'm not going to ask you to give me a show of hands, but you know who you are, right? You dread Monday morning. You count every minute that you're at work and you strive really hard just not to say something dumb or to do something that's going to bring attention to yourself or cause you to regret your day. Now, I don't want to make light of this because I know for some of you, your jobs are really difficult. I know for some of you that it really is a struggle, that you work with people who give you so much pushback, that there are things that are expected from you that cause pain and grief and hurt. And I am not belittling any of that. Some of you are overwhelmed and don't feel like there's any way out. You work for a boss, you work for management, that just makes your life miserable. I mean, that's a reality that happens. But you can find comfort in the fact that you can take your eyes off that boss, that manager, that supervisor, and you can put your eyes on God. Because God sees you and God sees what you do. He sees how hard you work and how dedicated you are and how you give even when you don't want to. God sees you. See, there's, th there's this reality, this fact that we carry with us everywhere we go, the reality that we are Christ followers, that we have Jesus in us. How we behave, how hard we work, how little we work, it's a reflection not only on us, but on the God that we serve. Paul spoke to the church um, in Colossae this way when it comes to work. He said, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward that the master and that the master you are serving is Christ. Paul believed it. He lived it. He taught this strong work ethic, respect for an employer because your boss is really Jesus. That's who you serve. Paul goes on to say, Timothy, teach this stuff. Teach this stuff. It's important. See, and if you're no longer in the workforce, 
how we behaved as an employee, how we behaved as an employer, it mattered. How you talk now to the next generation about your time as an employee matters. Do you talk about what an awful job you had or about the honor and what your job provided for you, for your family? The next generation is always watching. See, our work values, they matter. How am I instilling those work values? See, I am so proud of all of my children. They have got a strong work ethic, each and every one of them. You know, I've got, I've got two daughters who work in the medical field who work through COVID like crazy. I've got a son who owns a business. I've got another daughter who's a teacher, another one who's working as an office manager who's been promoted and promoted. I, I'm so proud of how hard they work. I don't know where they got it from all the time, but I'm really proud of how hard they work. Moving forward, 1 Timothy 6, 2. Teach these things, Timothy. Encourage everyone to obey them. So he's not saying push it down their throat. He's saying, Timothy, everything you do, be encouraging. Remember, Timothy, your boss is Jesus too. So be encouraging. Be encouraging to those around you. And then Paul just pounds this message home again, the message he's been saying through the first five chapters. Some people are going to contradict our teachings, but these are the wholesome teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. These teachings promote a godly life. Anyone who teaches something different is arrogant and lacks understanding. Such a person has unhealthy desire to quibble over the meaning of words. This stirs up arguments ending in jealousy, division, slander, and evil suspicions. That doesn't sound like fun. These people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt. They have turned their back on the truth. To them, now listen to this, because I'm going to bring it back up in a minute. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. It's that reminder again to Timothy, you're going to face pushback. You're standing up for a standard of Christ and you're going to face pushback. What a reminder to us. Our standard is Christ. We're going to face, face pushback. We're going to face pushback to the values that Christ has placed on us because people who don't know Jesus are behaving the way people who don't know Jesus are supposed to behave, like their human nature, like our human nature, like the rest of the world. Jesus' message is radically different than the rest of the world radically different than what our ingrained nature is. That's why he calls us to do this, to work, to strive, to become more like Christ, to make a difference in this world. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says it this way, throw off your old sinful nature, your former way of life, which is corrupt by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes, put on a new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. That's the way those weird followers of the way, that's why they were called Christians, little Christ, because they were so different than the world around them. And you're called to be different than the world around you. Not arrogantly different, but Christ-like different, full of grace and mercy and love. And then Paul makes this shift, this, this segue to the next big value that Paul wants to make Timothy aware of. And you may have caught it in verse five that I pointed out. See, these people that are stirring up trouble, living, living a Christ-like life isn't really their focus. To them, a show of godliness is just a way to become wealthy. 
And we're all like, okay, Paul, you really going to go there? You really going to go there with, with us, you know? Do you really want to go down the money train? And he's like, yes, apparently he does. So verse six, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. After all, we were brought, we brought nothing with us when we came into the world and we can take nothing with us when we leave. So if we have enough food and clothing, let us be content. Let us be content. Um, continuing our Bible verse, first time, people who long to be rich fall into temptation are trapped by many foolish, harmful desires that plunge them into ruin and destruction. So in front of me are a few Amazon packages. Confession time. There are two of us. I did put the word us in the congregation that this is this week's purchases. One of them is me. I admit it. One of them is me. You know, foolish, harmful desires. But I just need an attitude, right? I just need it. Greed, harmony, or should we call it Amazon? Did you know that with Amazon, anything, almost anything in the world is at your fingertips? You can buy things you never even knew you needed. You can buy flashlight gloves, glow-in-the-dark chopsticks. You can buy a yodeling pickle. You can buy a book on useless information. Everybody needs one of those, right? You can even buy slippers that are shaped like a fish. Walk around with fish on your feet. And for the bacon lovers, you can buy bacon toothpaste, bacon band-aids, bacon toilet paper, bacon flavored lip balm, and my favorite, bacon scented dryer sheets. Can you imagine what your neighbors would say? They'd think you're cooking bacon like all the time. It would be so fun. And there are so many items on Amazon that I can't even describe in church. I had to turn my eyes and go, mm-hmm. And if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can get a lot of those items same day. Order it before two o'clock. You'll have it before six o'clock. Isn't that fun? Confession, I am one of the worst Amazon sinners of all. So Friday, I'm in the living room and I hear Scott talking outside. He's talking to the Amazon driver again. I think we have two. He knows them both. I think by name. Gives them water bottles every week. We're going through a lot of water bottles. So yeah, they become his friends. So you need new friends? order from Amazon, apparently. You'll get lots of friends. See, now, Paul isn't saying that money is bad, and I'm not saying Amazon is evil. It can be used for good, too. I actually buy some things that I need on Amazon, like toilet paper, paper towel. You know, I do buy things I need. The key here is what Paul is saying, it's our, it's our focus. It's, it's our desire. If you're sitting there scrolling through Amazon on Saturday night, while you're watching a movie with your spouse, you might have a problem. <laughs> Not calling you out. You know who I'm talking about. Oh, So it's our desire. And money be can become a desire. Because how much is enough money? So first off, how rich is rich enough? So, so if you have $10,000 in the bank, a lot of people now say, oh, no, I need $100,000. I need a million dollars because there's always somebody who has more. 
You really never, never arrive when you get caught in that cycle and in that trap of needing more. A study by Forbes magazine revealed that the more money you have, the more money you need. So people making $50,000 a year think they need about $250,000 in order to live comfortably. And then it just kind of goes up from there. If you're like a millionaire, you know, you made your first million, then Forbes says, no, those people are wanting $100 million in the bank in order to be comfortable. There's no no end in sight when our focus becomes the ultimate goal instead of the desire of our heart. Again, Paul's not condemning the wealthy or even the not so wealthy because all of our wealth went here. See, the dollar amount isn't the issue. It's the desire. It's It's the heart. Where's your focus? Verse 10 says this, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Since some people crave money and have wandered from true faith and pierced themselves with any sor- with many sorrows. Rich or poor, somewhere in between, Paul says, don't let your money become your focus. Don't obsess with making it, growing it, spending it. Scott and I try to follow Dave Ramsey. And one of the things that he says as he encourages people to get a handle on their finances is live like no one else so that you can give like no one else. The focus is on your heart. When you learn to live conservatively and tightly, then you've got so much more to give is Dave Ramsey's philosophy. It's all about your heart. So, as we come to the end of First Timothy, you know, we're kind of left here now with, okay, slaves, work, employees, money. Now, what do we do? Well, I'm going to point you right back to what we've been doing all month long. I'm going to point you back to your homework. I, I encourage you to take chapter six. Spend some time reading it. Read it again. Read it again. Listen for the ouch. Listen for the pieces that pop out to you. How am I living my Christian life? How am I treating my employer? What's my attitude about my job? About my money? About my spending? About my giving? See, this last chapter, it has so many great lessons, so many life lessons for today. So so highlight it, note it, write down what jumps out to you. The cool thing about the Bible, it's living. It speaks to you at different seasons of your life just on what you need to hear. So I encourage you to read that. And as we close, I want to end with this advice to Timothy, this advice from Paul in his closing statement, this advice that's so fitting to all of us, all of us that we can glean scripture, we can hear words that apply to us so that we have something that we can build our Christian foundation on. This is what Paul says to Timothy. Timothy. Guard what God has entrusted you. I want to just stop right there for a second. Guard what God has entrusted to you. What has God entrusted to you? Maybe it is your job. Maybe you haven't been as grateful and appreciative of what your job does bring you, not the headaches. Maybe it is the income. Maybe it's the value that it puts on you. Maybe it's the home, your children, your family. How are you guarding them? How are you protecting them? Guard what God has entrusted 
to you. You might want to even write a list. These are the things that God has given me. That'd be a great thing to prepare for next week as we prepare for our Thanksgiving service next Sunday, is to begin writing down what has God entrusted to me. It goes on to say, avoid godless, foolish discussions with those who oppose you with their so-called knowledge. Some people have wandered from the faith by following such foolishness. Paul revisited this over and over again in all six chapters of Timothy. It was a big deal for the church in Ephesus. Maybe it's a big deal in your life too. Maybe you're listening to gossip. Maybe you're looking at things on the internet about end times or about church leadership or about Bible passages that put you know, women in one place or the, the structure of the church in one place. Revisit that. And then Paul ends with this. May God's grace be with you all. He's writing it to Timothy, but do you see the word all? May God's grace be with you all. And that's my prayer for all of you as we close. May God's grace be with you. Amen. God, I thank you for your word and for what we can learn from your word. God, I pray that as we continue to study um, this passage, that you would give us clarity, that you would speak to us in ways that we need to hear it this week that you would convict, that you would encourage, that you would be like, yeah, you've got that right. Keep going. God, I just pray that as we take inventory of the things that you have entrusted to us, that we would celebrate you in everything that you've given us as we prepare for Thanksgiving next week, that it would be a Sunday of celebration because you placed in our hearts, in our minds, what you have done for us. God, I, I pray for those in our congregation who have need. God, I thank you for Don and his willingness to share his story, his willingness to share your story of your work in the lives of people that he and Angela have touched, not only this week, but through the years. We thank you for their for their devotion to you. We thank you for their example that they have set. And God, we do pray for Angela. We continue to pray against cancer. We pray for a full and complete recovery for her. God, we just, we pray that we would see the tears subside, that the pain would completely go away, that that beautiful smile would not have to be masking pain. So we give her to you this morning, God. We also pray for Fred as he um, has surgery this week. And God, we just pray that you would be with the doctors, that everything would go smoothly, and that he would be with us in great shape next Sunday. God, I just thank you for this time. In your name, amen. amen.